Welcome back, everybody. I am still at the PMI Global Congress 2014 in Phoenix, Arizona. And with me right now is Frank Scatini. He is the Vice President of Information Technology for PMI. Hi, everyone. Hello, Frank. Hello Hi. there. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. What do you do for PMI in this position as VP of IT? Sure. I'm in charge of all of the uh, technology that we either build, manage, or deploy for the whole institute globally. So that includes everything from all the applications, the, the systems that actually do the certification processing, the continuing credits part of the system, as well as all the things, you know, the web properties in terms of development on those as well. Okay. So it's pretty much runs the full gamut of anything you can think of. It's technology is something we do. I also have the, um, the enterprise PMO um, for PMI actually is in my group as well. All right. Now, this is interesting because we're probably not going to be talking about any of this. That's right. <laughs> Why would we do something like that? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a free-flowing discussion today. And, uh, we want to get started with the 30th anniversary of the PMP exam. I wasn't even aware that was happening until I came here. And everybody was wearing these T-shirts. And I just want you to know, I'm very upset about this because I haven't gotten a T-shirt yet. So it's uh, no, actually, this is a, this is a phenomenal um, anniversary. We're very excited about it. We're excited about the, uh, the the growth of the PMP, and more importantly, the global acceptance of project management. We're seeing unparalleled access or interest in project management globally, both at the government level in all different uh, in governments around the world as well as obviously within organizations. So it's okay. a very exciting time. Yeah. So how has the PMP changed over the years, these 30 years, from your perspective? Well, it, it's been an interesting evolution. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the, the PMP exam itself and everything is really a reflection of what's really the key drivers and really what the standards are, you know, global in terms of project management, what are the accepted best practices. And obviously those have changed over time in that time frame. Initially, a lot of the focus was on uh, probably a lot of the technical skills. And I think as the profession has evolved, it's moved into some of the, what we call the softer skills, the leadership skills, as well as understanding business. So we're seeing kind of an evolution happening with the PMP, as well as what project managers have to do globally. So the other thing, for me, the, the most exciting part about the PMP, and we have over 600,000 globally at this stage, is over half of those are outside of North America. And um, that is actually an incredible, um, you know, statistic from our perspective because we've obviously grown fairly quickly. But the international acceptance has been even larger, as large as, in, as what we've seen in North America. And for us, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. One of the changes that I have personally seen, because I'm a PMP trainer, is that some students are coming back saying, oh, there were certain agile questions on the exam. So agile is the big trend. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as a PMP, I have to be aware of this, so it will be tested on the exam. But PMI also has the agile certified practitioner. Right. So do you see at some point emerging of this? Because everyone is talking about agile. And the question is, you know, is, is the ACP going to just explode and take off and the PMP is going to go down? I actually think, um, I think the PMP will always be the number one certification because it is an accurate, it is the reflection of what is the standard globally accepted practices across the world, which may include some of the agile tools and practices. And, you know, the great thing about the exam, it's the questions are written by volunteers, professionals, and that they're going to evolve over time. And as the industry involves, so will the exam. From the agile perspective, we saw that you know there was a lot of misunderstanding as to what Agile was. Was it Scrum? Was it XP or whatever? So when we started exploring the Agile certification, we weren't sure where we were going to end up because we actually don't do certifications for the sake of doing certifications. We do it based on what the market need is. And when we got the Agile experts, including uh, one of the original writers of the Agile Manifesto to work with us on the team, when we did the, our research and investigation, we found the key problem that we had to solve was people two people couldn't define Agile the same way. So we went back to the grassroots of the Agile Manifesto and said, okay, here's really the, cool, the primary knowledge areas and then associated with that. And that's really, really what drove that exam. Now, a lot of those things in terms of being nimble and fast and, and self-empowered teams and different leadership models is actually what we're seeing in industry today. So you are seeing, in some cases, you know, more of those types of questions um, associated with the PMP as the PMP evolves. 
I think there'll always be room for both of them. And I think the PMP will always be number one. One thing that Ricardo Triano talked about yesterday was the talent triangle. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is important for project managers, for PMPs in particular. Tell us a little bit more about it. What is it? Sure. Um, so if you go back to you know, the PMP, you know, traditionally people looked at project managers um, when we looked at the PMBOK guide, really focused on making sure that you understood you manage scope, you manage cost, and you manage the, the schedule. And when you look at that, that was a real focus. So what we call, the, we actually call those things technical skills. Now, there was a level set that had to happen there, and everybody had to make sure that they knew the technical skills, but you're not going to succeed in, in an organization with just technical skills because that's really just an order taker. When it comes down to it, when you look at organizations, you have to take into account the organizational structure. Some organizations are very hierarchical. Others are more collaborative in nature. So you, as a project manager, have to adjust your management style. And what we call that, that's really, when we talk about the talent triangle, one leg of that triangle is actually what we call the technical skills, the traditional things we called risk management. All those things are part of that traditional leg. One of the other legs is what we call leadership, and that's really where the soft skills come in. In some organizations, you know, standing up and stand, saying you're in charge of that works very effectively. In others, most of us work in organizations where we have to collaborate across the organization and try to get buy-in from all the different stakeholder groups. And that part of the soft skills, if you will, a great leader or a great project manager is able to manage and traverse the different layers of the organization and the complexities to try to get everybody focused on the same objective to meet those same deadlines and to provide the business value. The other leg is what we call business and strategy um, acumen. And you know what we tell uh, project managers, including the ones that are on my team, is it's not good enough to just be able to deliver us the technical skills to manage the projects. It's not good enough to be able to lead the teams. You also have to have a knowledge of what the overall objective is, because in the end, it's all about business value. You can't provide business value unless you understand what the business's objectives are or strategy. So part of that is also we ask for them to say, okay, we need you to understand what the overall objectives and then provide value in terms of suggesting different ways of doing it. That's where the value add comes in, being able to deliver based on the, your technical skills, being able to lead the team, and then also help working with the business to actually deliver the value that they're looking for. So that's what we're calling the talent triangle. Um, it, you know, we, we used to talk about a thing called the triple constraint, and that really, all those elements really were just part of the, the, the technical skills leg of the triangle. Um, it's something we've actually been endorsing for probably the last four years, but lately over the last year, it's something we're really pushing for. And that's something when you look at the PMP going forward, I think there'll be a much heavier emphasis on those other two legs. One of the interesting statistics that we have is you need to have 60 credits or 60 hours really of PDUs over a three-year cycle to retain your PMP. And one of the interesting aspects is really the number one and two areas of people getting credits is actually in those soft skills, negotiation skills, being able to work with other leaders, being able to communicate in the language of your stakeholders. So those are really the key things. And really when we talk about project managers, they have to be those well-rounded individuals. That's a very interesting statement because the one thing that I've noticed recently is that more and more people want to get their PDUs online, mm -hmm. uh, on demand, if possible, even on my iPhone. And these kind of skills, to me, they don't seem to be the skills that you can get through those means. This yeah. is more something where you are in a classroom and you work together with a group. How do you see that? What yeah. do you find? I think um, for, for individuals to, to continue in their profession, they have to continually look at ways to improving their skill set. I think some things, I think to your point, are very effectively done online. I think some things are very effectively done in a classroom training scenario where they actually can do live role play, for example, or handle real examples. So I, I think you know, having a good, well-rounded, balanced set of training to renew your profession, I think is important. Whether you use it for PDUs or not is you know, a different question, but I think it's really important that individuals have a variety of different ways that they learn, including reading articles, talking to others, and you know, talking to mentors, seeing how they succeed. Those are other ways of doing these things. So in the end, it's all about how do you improve yourself so that you can provide the value that the organization really needs. A little while back, PMI also added the portfolio management professional, the PFMB. Who's that one for? 
that one's really for, you know, it's interesting as in, when you look at value and when we talk about project program and portfolio management, that's really who we target, the PPPM, if you will. So there was, a, there was definitely a gap there of value that we weren't necessarily providing, again, to the profession, which was we'd highlighted project management, then we focused on program management. You highlighted ACP. We also have scheduling and risk, which are really more specialty credentials. We're, one area we weren't really necessarily addressing was that higher level portfolio management side. And so the portfolio management certification is really focused on those individuals that work with organizations to manage their project portfolio. So it's really a gap in the whole process that we had identified that organizations have been asking us, similar to the ACP challenge where people couldn't define, you know, agile in any given organization. And by the way, those questions came from not necessarily the developers. It was actually coming from the human resources groups and the, their managers. They didn't know what to hire for. So the whole point of ACP was having that standard definition so everybody could apply it. Similarly, when you think about portfolio management, it's a critical skill to being able to manage your portfolio so you not only deliver projects on time, on budget, and meet business benefits, but they're also the right projects. So if you're taking on projects and you're successful in delivering them, but they're not helping you advance your strategic plan and they're not aligned to your strategy, then you really made no progress. You actually just spent money. So in the end, that whole strategic alignment of the portfolio to the strategic plan is really critical. And being able to manage that portfolio, given the fact that in some organization you have a wide, diverse group of individuals that you have to coordinate in terms of the, the different strategic business units, those are all challenges that have to happen. So portfolio management is really focused on that area. I think project managers get that projects are supposed to be strategic. They're supposed to be aligned to the strategy of your organization. Uh, how is it the other way around? From the PMI's perspective, what do you find? You know, leadership in an organization, do they realize that our, our strategy should be translated into actions through projects? Uh, fundamentally, the answer is very simple. No. <laughs> so, you know, part of our, part of our thought leadership is uh, we focus on what we call the um, pulse of the profession. And a study we did a year ago from the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit talked to a lot of CEOs around the world and asked them whether strategic implementation was important. And 88% of them said it was. It does make you wonder what the other 12% were thinking, but that's okay. We won't go down that path. And 61% said that implementing strategy was actually very difficult. You know, and they weren't at the level of success that they were looking at. When you translate that, take that step and say, okay, strategy implementation is really projects and programs, they think that's actually tactical. So if you think about it, you have a strategic plan, and part of the, your strategic plan, you have strategic initiatives that you need to accomplish that you, in order to achieve your strategic plan objectives. Those strategic initiatives are actually projects and programs, but yet those are considered tactical. So there's a huge disconnect. And and really what we're really focusing on is the communications and making sure that when we talk about business value, we're talking at the C-level, suite level. We're not talking at the project manager level. CEOs don't care about work breakdown structures. They don't care about a lot of stuff, but they do care about is how they're advancing their mission. So part of what our challenge is and what we're trying to help the rest of the profession is making a, that awareness happen at the C-suite level that strategy implementation is projects and programs, and it is strategic. So what can project managers do who are at the tactical level to get this point across to the C-suites? Well, I think the first thing they can do, and this is something that we all challenge. You, you, we talked earlier about my role as, um, as the head of IT at, at PMI. So when I talk to my business peers or my CEO, I never talk about technology. Mm -hmm. I talk about what the business value is and what the business objectives are and what the business solutions are we're trying to accomplish. I don't talk about things in the language I speak in. I talk in the language, or I try to talk because I'm not always successful. I try to talk in the language that they're interested in. So when project managers are, are talking to their executive sponsors, some of them may be interested in knowing that, you know, okay, we're 43% complete of the project in terms of schedule. We've spent 35% of the budget, so it looks like we're underrun. They may be interested in that, okay? They may be more interested in understanding what the actual value is we're providing and that these two features that are critical to them are in good shape or not in good shape or what the things are they really need to know. 
So it's really talking in the language of the individual because you walk in there with a WBS breakdown and go item by item. <laughs> you're, you're not, losing them after the third one. <laughs> you're not going to be in there very often. They're going to be coming up with all kinds of excuses not to meet with you because they'll be instantly busy. So the, really the focus is when you have that opportunity, you have that face time, it's really critical that you communicate in the language that they're interested in, not in your language, and get across the message that they're really most focused on. So the one thing we tell people is, as project managers, make sure you're communicating in the language of the individual you're targeting, not in your own language. So that's really important. And the other thing is making sure that you understand how your project is aligned to the overall strategy of the organization. You are not, probably not going to be able to drive what, you know, what projects happen or don't happen. But when they are assigned, you need to make sure you can map that up there and continue to show what that alignment is. And if you understand what the alignment is, you may be able to find faster, better, cheaper ways of getting there because you actually understand how things tie together. And you may be able to potentially even get a project canceled and focus on something else that might get there faster. That's where the value comes in. And then that's when you're going to get the retention level. Another certification that PMI has recently launched, or rather it's in the beta phase, uh, is the PMI Professional in Business Analysis, the PMI mm -hmm. PBA. Mm -hmm. So what's the current status of that? It's in pilot mode. Um, we've had a, a significant number of, uh, I think over 700 people have taken the exam, I believe. And so we're evaluating the results and things like that so we can factor all those things so we can finalize the exam because we always do tweaking at the end based on how you know what the questions were, how they rated, and all those things. So you know we'll be coming out with it soon. It's really interesting. You know we we get asked the questions like why did you decide to come up with a with a PBA? And and it's like for us it's like kind of funny because the question is why didn't we do this ten years ago? You look at every statistic known on projects why projects fail. Requirements management tends to be number one on the list of why projects fail. They're not defined properly. They're not at the level of detail. The executive sponsor didn't understand it, et cetera, et cetera. So we have really have had a, a dearth of focus or a lack of focus on requirements management for a long time. And as we really started looking at everything we were doing, we said, you know what, there's a huge gap here and we need to focus on that. And in organizations today, business analysts actually provide that from a role perspective and end up performing that role in a lot of organizations. They're not the only ones that do requirements management, mm -hmm. but they tend to be um, a fairly large group. So really, when you look at business areas, they focus a lot of times on business analysts actually defining the requirements. Though, in reality, you also have project managers doing it a lot too, depending on the size of the project, et cetera. Now, when it comes to business analysis, there is already an existing certification out there, mm -hmm. uh, the CBAP. Mm -hmm. How well was the PBA received? We've actually had incredible acceptance of the PBA, and we actually worked, we tried to work very closely with um, that other association to reach some kind of joint agreement and everything it, to the point where they took it to the board, and their board actually rejected um, the partnership arrangement that we had said. So, you know, in looking at it, you know, we, ne we needed to do this for our profession. We've literally have not addressed requirements management within the PM profession ever. We, you know, when we had special interest groups, there was no requirements management for special interest groups. When we had communities of practice, there was no requirements management community of practice. There was for schedule management, risk management, but there wasn't anything for requirements management. So we actually started one up and have had, you know, a lot of participation. It's actually been one of our most prolific communities of practice that we have today. Since we announced the PBA um, and we, you know, shared the story of, you know, how we tried to have the relationship and everything, the acceptance uh, and the interest level in it has really been fast. It's been, um, it's actually probably been faster than uh, the ACP, which was our, which has been our fastest growing uh, certification. Mm -hmm. Now, if I remember correctly, you have a big requirements management tract here at the Congress right Correct. now. Is that right? So is this a reflection of the PBA and the, the need that you see? We have to talk about requirements? Yeah. You know, like I said, it's been a, you know, it's funny because, you know, people ask, why are you doing this? The answer is, why didn't we do it for the last 10 years? <laughs> I can't answer why we didn't focus on this last 10 years, but it's a big mess. It, it really is. The, it's the number one reason why projects fail. We, as a professional, as a you know, project management profession, why would we not focus our energy on that? Why would we focus on all the other things, which are also important? So it was really a, a miss on our part. So 
yeah, from our perspective, it's critical that we address it now and that we focus a lot of energy on it, which is why you're seeing on our projectmanagement.com site, we have a knowledge center of excellence focused on requirements management. Um, we're trying to do more webinars in that space and really try to get the word out there because in the end, from our perspective, we want everyone's projects to succeed. We need want to improve the acceptance rate, the, the approval rate, because the more projects succeed, the more likely they're going to provide business benefits and the more likely that organizations are going to recognize that and attribute their success to it, which means our professional will be accepted even better. So it really is a mission for us to do this. And, you know, everything we do, we try to work collaboratively. The ACP, we work collaboratively with um, other associations, other agile specific areas, and they actually, some of them partnered with us. Um, we had the ex-managing director of the Scrum Alliance was on our steering committee for ACP, you know, as I mentioned, you know, so we have always worked with other associations um, trying to in a partnership arrangement whenever we could. We started out our conversation with the 30th anniversary of the PMP and how the profession has changed and, and the many uh, other certifications that PMI offers. Let's close by looking a little bit into the future. Where do you see our profession as a whole going? Not in terms of certifications, but in terms of what a project manager needs to know in order to be successful in five, ten years from today. Well, you know, it's funny. When you think about the business leaders of today and what skills they need to be successful, it goes back to the talent triangle. They have to have technical skills to do their job. They have to have leadership skills to lead their organizations. And they have to have business and strategic acumen to be able to help drive the business. That's what we think our project managers need to have as well. So if you think about that, there's actually a potential growth. So great PMs will become great business leaders. If there's actually a natural progression from that, from our profession, what we're looking for organizations to accept and acknowledge is at the high level, at the C-level, projects, programs, portfolio management, PMOs are strategic to the organization's needs. And getting acceptance of that, and by organizations and individuals delivering that value and showing how to the C-suite how that actually happens and how they can actually meet their objectives, now all of a sudden our profession takes a whole nother level. It becomes a de facto that we are a strategic partner. We're a key part, a key cog of every organization. Some organizations get it. IBM is very project-based driven. There's a lot of organizations out there, you know, um, Huawei is another one that's very project-based. So everything they do really focuses on that. And so they focus on, a, you know, raising the level of their project managers and their, and their profession in general so that they can achieve the numbers that they need to achieve so they can be successful and viable organizations. For us, we want the rest of the world to acknowledge that. It's going to help all of us be more successful if we spend less money and get more benefit out of it. I think we're going to see a lot of amazing things on the sustainability side, you know, individuals when we have disasters being able to recover instead of sending you know millions and millions of dollars of food and having it sit in a warehouse that nobody can eat it if we have an effective project management strategy we can actually get it to the people who really need it at the crisis time and i mean those are really challenges you know from a philanthropic point of view that we can provide same thing with organizations and governments excellent frank thank you so much for your time today my pleasure anytime